All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our lesson. Our Father, I pray for wisdom now, Lord, and the gift of teaching. And I pray you'd open the hearts of the folks to receive your word. As the Bereans, the, they searched the scriptures to see if those things were so. And may that be our motivation to see if these things are so. In thy name we pray, amen. And I don't know if you know it or not, but today is a very important day as it relates to Israel. Some of you are aware of what's happening today, and some of you are not. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't care about uh, singling anyone out. But how many of you today uh, did not know that something very important is happening as it relates to Israel? Think about it. The news media has kept this quiet, and they have a vested interest, interest to do that. Seventy nations are meeting in Paris, France today to determine and pass a resolution that says that Israel must accept a two-state solution and that it must revert back to its pre-1967 borders. Therefore, it gives up East Jerusalem. It gives up uh, its uh, claim to any portions of the West Bank, so-called West Bank, which is Judea and Samaria. And that uh, this, of course, includes the Temple Mount and the Wailing Wall, the most holy site in Israel to the Jew. Now, just imagine for a moment what these people are doing. All of this has, uh, has received impetus from Barack Obama because of John Kerry and what he said the other day. And uh, he, it's obvious he's no friend of Israel. And they are turning against Israel publicly. So I want to do a little thing with you this morning. It's very important to understand what's happening because this has some, this has some definite ramifications. This is what's important about this. Uh, we know that when the Antichrist shows up, that he's going to sign a peace a treaty with Israel. We know that. And we know that the seven years of Jacob's trouble or the time of the Great Tribulation is directly related to this peace treaty. We know that. And we know that Jerusalem is a burdensome stone and that, uh, that uh, it, was, it will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We know that. And if you're a Bible believer, you've read your scripture and you understand that Jerusalem is the focal point of all Bible prophecy. Amen. Everything else is peripheral. If America shows up in Bible prophecy, ho-hum. <laughs> the main issue is Jerusalem and it's Israel. And uh, they are the nation that God judges every other nation by because he says plainly that if the nations are friendly to Israel, they can go into the millennium. If they're not friendly to Israel, then they'll, turn into, they'll be turned into judgment and damnation. That is national judgment. That's not individual judgment. That's not individual salvation. That's national salvation. And it's not the new birth. It simply has to do with the fact that this nation, whichever nation that uh, sheep nations, we call them, that he puts on his right hand, if they survive, they're able to go into the millennium and sit under the, uh, or live under the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sovereignty of Israel because Israel will become the head of all the nations again. The land of Israel will be partitioned off as it has been in the past to all the 12 tribes of Israel. The throne of David will be reestablished in Jerusalem and the Messiah and his light will go forth from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. During the millennium, the nations will be required to come up to Jerusalem and observe the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't come to Jerusalem and observe the Feast of Tabernacles, Zechariah tells you exactly what kind of plague comes upon them. Their skin literally rots away on their, on their body. Their flesh does. It's like that, uh, you've seen that, uh, uh, I don't know what they call it, it's some kind of a virus or, or uh, it's, I don't know if it's a virus, but it's something skin, skin eating. Uh, what's, you can pick it up in the water and uh, bacteria. It's a bacterial. Yes, yeah, it's not a virus, it's a bacteria. And, uh, and it's a terrible thing. And the Bible says that their flesh will consume away on their body. Now, uh, this is as it relates to Jerusalem. Jerusalem in Hebrew means a city of peace. In 1000 BC, David overcame the Jebusites. And once he overcame the Jebusites, he established his, uh, his throne in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem became the head uh, and the capital of Israel. And Solomon, his son, built the temple in Jerusalem. God said, I'll place my name there. And he did place his name there because no other place was allowed to be a place of sacrifice except Jerusalem. 
during the Great Schism under, under, uh, under, uh, under uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son Rehoboam, during the Great Schism, ten tribes uh, went to the north and two stayed in the south and they had their own priesthood and their own place of sacrifice. But God never recognized it and honored it. Only Jerusalem is where he had placed his name. So Jerusalem becomes the focal point of all the Bible prophecy, everything as it relates to Israel. Otherwise, ho-hum, who cares? And I've had so many people ask me that say, well, the preacher doesn't, doesn't, isn't this something as, as, as profound as the United States of America? Don't you think they're in Bible prophecy? Well, I'm not saying they're not, but it's not, it's not prominent in the sense that it just jumps off the pages of Scripture. So the, what is prominent in Bible prophecy is that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Wow. In May the 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion stood up over there and declared that Israel was once again a sovereign nation. Yeah. They were driven from their land by Hadrian. And when Hadrian drove them out of their land, a Roman emperor under the Roman Empire, Hadrian drove them from their land, crucified Jews all over the place, in, uh, and, and the reason he did this is because the rebellion uh, under Titus and other rebellions, the Jews had always rebelled and rebelled and rebelled against foreign intervention because Israel is the land of uh, the, the, the land, Haaretz, Eretz, Israel is the land of Israel. They had rebelled against it and uh, they wound up uh, being driven from their home. And if they appeared again in the land of Israel, it was on the pain of death. He changed the name of Jerusalem to Aaliyah Capitolina, created Cardo Maximus, uh, erected a statue of Zeus, and turned it into a cosmopolitan city. And the reason he did this is because he wanted to, to get rid of every vestige of Judaism that he could possibly get rid of because it belonged to the Jews. He knew that. And he changed the name of Israel, Israel. You remember Jacob whose name was changed to Israel? He changed the name of Jerusalem from, uh, from Jerusalem to Aaliyah Capitolina, and he changed the name of Israel to Palestine. And the reason he used the word Palestine is because it relates to the ancient is enemy of Israel, the, the Philistines. So in other words, he was saying it is Philistine land now. So anytime you see someone use the term Palestine today, and most of them use it, not completely understanding what's going on, and I may on occasion use it if I'm reading something, so forth, and you have people today who are called Palestinians. That gives them a direct connection to the Philistines. This is why there's a couple of books in the library that is called Philistine. Uh, uh, Ramon, uh, I forget what his last name is, but uh, it's a very good read to give you a good idea of what's going on in that land. Philistine, the Philistine, Palestine. Philistine land. And so when Hadrian did that, he did that to smite the Jews, to spite them and change the name of the land. But that's not going to change the identity of the land. Here in the book of Genesis chapter number 13 and Genesis 15, you'll find two passages in the Bible that are remarkable in the way they're constructed because you need to read these passages along with me and you'll see what we're talking about. Look at Genesis chapter 13 verse 14. Genesis 13, 14. Now, if you'll notice, the context is when Abram separated himself from Lot. <coughs> Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what I'm talking about? The LGBT movement in America? Okay. Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abram separated himself from him, verse 14. And the Lord said, Now lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Four points of the compass. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it. Now watch this. And to thy seed forever. Now that's a, that's a, <laughs> there's no end to that. And when he means, when he says seed forever, he's talking about an eternity. Because the Christian is nowhere said to inherit the land. Our inheritance is not the earth, but the Jews' inheritance is. They will inherit the earth. This is why the meek shall inherit the earth. The uh, Sermon on the Mount is a Jewish context of a Jewish uh, 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 kingdom. 
So he said here in verse number, uh, verse 15, uh, to thy seed forever. And I make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. That's a lot of people. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Now this is totally, completely a one-sided deal where God says, I'm going to do this regardless. Now you notice that the Lord didn't call a council. He didn't call any advisors in, ask them what they thought about this. He simply made this declaration. So how can he get away with that? He's God. <laughs> That's how he gets away with it. <laughs> Look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 17. Now here we have a blood covenant. Now watch this. A promise in 13, now we've got a blood covenant going on. Genesis chapter 15, verse 17. came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And you can go back and read the scripture right before that. Abraham had separated these and laid them out. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying... Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, which is the eastern boundary of the land of Eden. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaims, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Gergesites, and the Jebusites, which are all uh, in the land and have no business being there. In plain words, this all belongs to to Abram. Now I want you to notice something about this covenant. Abram's dead asleep. This is an unconditional covenant. Abram didn't have to agree to anything. Just like the other one. God said, I'm going to do this. This is the way it's going to be. And nothing's going to alter that. Now I want you to think about something. Abraham lived 1,900 years before Christ. This is nearly 4,000 years ago. All right? Now, 4,000 years ago, how many people do you suppose were living in America? <laughs> there was no New York. There was no Paris. There was no London. None of these places existed. But there was a Melchizedek. And his, his headquarters was Salem. Shalom. That's the Hebrew for peace. Yerushalayim means the city of peace. Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God before Aaron was ever born. And so therefore there was a priesthood, there was a holy place, there was a access to God, and this priest, Melchizedek, there was nobody on the face of this earth any greater than this man. The fact of the matter is that Abraham paid tithe to this man. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, truly the less is blessed of the greater. And so Melchizedek blessed Abraham. See, not Abraham blessing Melchizedek. The only reason you can bless God is because God's already blessed you. <laughs> You've received the blessing from God, you return in kind. If you hear a man that's all he does is curse, 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 that's because he's cursed. He's full of cursing and bitterness because he's cursed. He has no blessing to return to God. So a man by his own mouth condemns himself. So Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek, who is the priest of the Most High God. That term, Most High God, you trace it in the Old Testament, you'll find over and over and over again, it's a direct reference to God as it relates to Gentiles. Not Jehovah, yod heh vow heh not Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God between God and Israel, his people. But the Most High God is the God that is the God of the Gentiles, as he relates to them, in plain words, he's the sovereign of the earth. And so here in Genesis chapter number 17, uh, the Lord is making a covenant with Abraham and saying, this land is going to be your land. And from and all of these Gentiles that are in here, these, these, these people who are usurpers, who are squatters, if you please, uh, they belong to you. It's your land. Now, this was done a long time ago. Now, when you deal with a rabbi today and, he, and talk to him about a two-state solution, he'll take the Bible and he'll open up the Tanakh and he'll point that scripture out and he'll say to you, what about this? This was long before Muhammad was ever born. Muhammad lived in the 7th century after Christ. 
He was born in 630-something A.D., died in, uh, I've got his dates here somewhere. And he, uh, he was a six, uh, let's see, 570, 570, born 570 A.D., died 632 A.D. This is Muhammad. He's the founder of Islam. All right. Now, here we have people showing up. They're showing up 2,600 years after this land grant was given to Abraham, and they're making claim to the land that God gave Abraham. Now, that's fact. Don't you think about that for a minute. And the United States of America has interjected itself into this and now has become an arbiter, and now they have become a... They have become a biased arbiter. Yes. And they're going to take this land, Judea and Samaria, which is the West Bank of the Jordan River. That's the heart land of Israel, folks. They're going to take Judea and Samaria, and they're going to take it away from Israel, and they're going to give it to the Philistines and create a two-state solution. Now, we're going to cover the history in just a moment. We'll go back and look at that. But you'll just think about the context of it for a moment. If these people that are in Israel right now are Jews, if they are Jews, then we've got a situation going on here that we better take a close look at. Because God said this to Abraham, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse him that curseth you. And nowhere was that ever rescinded. And the Bible says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Not the peace of New York or Knoxville, but the peace of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city of peace. And it's been anything but that for the last 2,000 years since Christ was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem and nailed to a tree. Now, the history, of Jeru- the history of Israel goes way back before 1948, but I'm going to pick it up in 1948. We could go back to the first Zionist Congress by Theodore Herzl in Basel, Switzerland. We could go back to the, when he called the people together in what's called Zionism. There's an awful lot of people today that do not believe that Zionism is biblical. They And a, lo- a, lot, of the, a lot of the Orthodox Jews over there in Israel do not believe that Zionism is is biblical. Of course, they enjoy the benefits of living in a country where they can go up and pray at the Wailing Wall, and they can they can enjoy their they have their own communities. If you're in Israel and you're not dressed right, your bus driver will not take you through the Orthodox Jewish community, especially ladies. They won't tolerate the uh, the, the 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 promiscuous dress that gives so much so many of the people in this country have especially the women. They won't tolerate it. And uh, they live in their own enclaves. But you see them all over the place. But here's the bottom line. If it were not for the Israeli government and the Israeli military that, that, that establishes the authority of a nation state, these people would be driven from there in a heartbeat. But then they're against Zionism. It's always convenient to be against something until you have to pay the price for it. But in any event, Israel is, the, is a land of, of, uh, of uh, what, do you, what do you call it, freedom. Uh, it's, it's a democracy. Uh, it's the only democracy in all of the Arab countries. The only one, folks. You need, to, you need to put that down in the back of your mind. The only one. The only one. Arab nations do not govern themselves with freedom of speech and the freedom of uh, religion and the freedoms that they have in Israel and that we have in this country. This is why for so long we've been, we've been, uh, we've been friends with Israel. But May the 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion stood up and declared Israel to be a nation, a sovereign nation. The next day, this is when the British had pulled, them, had pulled out. The British mandate had wrapped it up. The British had pulled out. And so now Israel stepped in and said, we are going to be a nation Again, the, uh, the, the Jordanian, Egyptian, Syrian, Lebanese, Iraqi, and Saudi troops immediately attacked this little fledgling nation. Can you imagine? 
outnumbered 10, sometimes 100 to 1. The odds of them surviving were astronomical. And anybody that knows anything about history will tell you in a heartbeat, that was a miracle Amen. that they survived. Amen. It's a miracle. That's a, that's a modern day miracle that Israel is over there on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. This was the War of Independence in 1948. When that war ended, Jordan controlled the West Bank, <coughs> which is Judea, Samaria, <coughs> East Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, uh, many of these places that are so sacred to the Jews for the next 19 years. Jordan controlled that. What did they do? Well, of course, they're magnanimous, gracious, peace-loving, liberty-loving people. They let the Jews come and pray at the Wailing Wall, and then no, they did not. <laughs> when an authoritarian, dictatorial outfit like that comes into power, the first thing they do is shut you off from your freedoms. And you let the right bunch come into power in this nation, the progressive left that is shoving this perversion down your throat, if they ever did have absolute control of this country, they'd shut those doors right there in a heartbeat. And you would not be able to come into the house of God and worship the Lord unless you march to their tune, cross their T's, dot their I's exactly the way they do it. It would not happen. It's not going to happen. These people don't want freedom. Uh, but anyway, 14th, 1948, this, is hap this happened. In 1967, which is called the Six-Day War, yeah. the Arabs had, beating the war, had been beating the war drum for some time. Nasser was the president of Egypt, and he had shut off the, the, uh, the access to Elat, which is on the northern shore of the Red Sea. He had shut off, he'd, sh he'd done that. They were amassing armies. They were preparing to come. Israel has the Mossad, and they have a very, very good uh, uh, intelligence network. They have to. Because for them, every day is a day of survival. Every day. So they've got to know what's going on. They knew that an attack was imminent. So they had a preemptive strike against Egypt. They destroyed the Egyptian Air Force completely on the ground. Destroyed. And then uh, over the next five days, after that first day of battle, over the next five days, defeated these other Arab armies. And another miracle ensued. 1967, but here's the clincher. This is the part. This is the rub that's going on today. They took East Jerusalem. They took the Temple Mount. They took the Wall. They took the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. They took the Sinai Peninsula. They took the Gaza Strip. All of this was the spoils of war. Like Obama told uh, uh, the senator from Arizona, he said elections have consequences. Uh, John McCain. I was, I was watching him when he said that. He said, elections have consequences. Well, let me tell you something. Wars have consequences too. <laughs> so when they won this 1967 six-day war, they increased the size of Israel to a point where they could defend it because before that, they had an area that was indefensible. It was, it was horrible. It was how small. I think it was something like nine miles. And the generals had told them, we cannot defend this small of an area. But once they won that war in 1967, the borders uh, were defensible then. And, of course, they gained a good bit of property, a good bit of real estate. Now, they didn't take anything from a, from a foreign power. That was their land to begin with. That was the land that Hadrian had taken away from them. You know, that was, that was their land to start with. But this is what's called the occupied territory today. It goes back to 67. The occupied territory according to the United Nations, which is an illegitimate piece of garbage sitting up there on the Hudson River, according to them, this occupied territory includes, now listen to this, the occupied territory includes the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, East Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and whatever else they want to throw in there. This is called occupied territory. Now what's What's creating a stir among these people are the settlements that Israel is building on their own land. 
And of course, they've got a reason for all of that. I understand that. I know they've got their agenda. Anybody can, you don't have to read much to understand that. They've got a reason for building these settlements. But here's the bottom line. In 1948, 1948, there was a uh, UN partition plan. This was created by the United Nations in 1948, right before they went to war. And do you know what that plan uh, offered to the Arabs and to the Jews? A two-state solution. That's the UN offered that plan. Two-state solution. Most people don't know this, but just check me out. And do you know what happened? The Jews accepted it and the Arabs rejected it. Do you know why they rejected it? Because the true motive of these people is not two states. The true motive of these people is to drive the Jews into the ocean and literally destroy them. That's the true motive, not a two-state solution. Because the bottom line is this, they know it and you know it. If Israel today handed more land over, signed over a two-state deal, had an enemy at their doorstep, and all of this, do you think that would stop Iran, Hezbollah? You think that would stop uh, ISIS or anybody else who's going to try to overrun these? No, it's not going to stop anything. It's just going to make them weaker by giving up more land. And that is the reality of it. And that is what uh, John Kerry did not allude to the other day when he was talking, making his, his speech and all this lecturing everybody about what's going on over there. He didn't make one single reference to the simple fact that Israel is surrounded by enemies. They're surrounded by terrorists that will never compromise. They seek their destruction and they're not going to stop until Israel ceases to exist. And they can sign all the peace agreements they want to and give up all the land they want to. It's not going to change anything. That's a simple fact. Jerusalem is a burdensome stone and it should be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And we're running into that time, though. This is what makes it so exciting. 1973 was the last major war. It's called the War of Yom Kippur. It happened when they, when they attacked Israel on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the most holy day in the calendar of Israel. It's the Day of Atonement. Seventh month, tenth day of the month. The Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur. Israel was fasting. They had their phylacteries on. They were going to their synagogues. They were, they were doing what they do on the most holy day. And in plain words, the Arabs said they will be the most vulnerable on this day. This is when we will attack. And that's when they attacked. And for the first few hours of it, it was very scary, very scary for Israel in the first few hours of that assault. But God once again intervened. And he means for that land to be there. And he means for those Jews to be there. Because they relate directly to the Antichrist. They've got to be there for that scripture to be fulfilled. And it will be fulfilled exactly as God said it would. Amen. Now, I've got an article here off of uh, World Net Daily. And this is written by Leo Homan. And this is about this two-state solution that's going to be rammed down the throat of Israel by the illegitimate United Nations, a meaningless organization that is completely anti-Israel and anti-Christ. Uh, for the sake of time, I've been going on here for 30 minutes. For the sake of time, I won't read everything, but I'll read down to a certain point here. Now listen to this. Israel is bracing for more hostile declarations from a block of more than 70 nations meeting Sunday in Paris with the goal of embracing a document that calls for a two-state solution with a Palestinian state formed within the 49 border boundaries. In other words, before pre-67. Israel will not even have a representative in Paris, nor will Israel be present when Pope, now watch this, Francis meets with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas the day before on Saturday. In other words, they met yesterday. This has led some to describe the Pope's meddling as tantamount to having a wedding without the groom. <laughs> this weekend's developments are just the latest in a three-week nightmare for Israel 
that has coincided with the final month of Barack Obama's presidency. Now, this is remarkable stuff in here, and I'll, I'll get a little further into it, uh, but I want to mention something here. This pope is a Jesuit. Malachi Martin, uh, some time back, who was, who was a Jesuit himself, said that Satan had entered the sanctuary of the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't long after he said that he suffered a mysterious death. He died. What he was trying to say is that an element has entered in to the Vatican that wants to, that wants to produce a one-world government with the Vatican as the religious head, of course, mean the pope, of the head of that one world government, they will, contro they will uh, control the one world religion. Have you noticed how that the pope is personally involved in what's going on over here in Jerusalem and in the partitioning of this land? He could be anywhere doing anything, but no, and I'm going to tell you why he's there, he understands the importance of what's going on in Jerusalem. To not get too deeply into the occult part of it, but there's a good bit of information out there. You know that the leader of the Russian church, uh, his name is Kirill. I uh, forget what they call him, Metropolitan. Uh, he's the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. He made a surprise visit. I think it was to Arctic. I read this article a few, a few weeks back. He made a surprise visit to the Arctic. Antarctic, thank you, Antarctic. He made a surprise visit to the Antarctic. This pope has made quite a few advances toward this man. They've been meeting, they've been talking, and there's no doubt in my mind about the fact that Francis is laying the groundwork for his one world religion. But why did he go to the Antarctic? There's a lot of speculation about what's going on in the Antarctic. Now, I've told you about Operation High Jump. Do you remember Admiral Richard Byrd? Admiral Byrd, they think, he's, they think he went off the deep end. They think he went nuts. They think he went insane. Of course, any time you disagree with the party line and you're not part of the, the media uh, narrative, they, they're going to they're say you're nuts. They're going to say you're nuts. And, uh, but this man, Admiral Byrd, led an expedition of thousands of troops to Antarctica in 1947, right after the war. They went down there ostensibly on the surface of it to, to, to check into the possibility of uh, exploration uh, to resources, natural resources, uh, fuel, what have you, and all that. You know, uh, but they say, he, he says, that when he was there, he encountered vehicles that flew in the sky that absolutely blew his mind in their ability to move. He said they could fly from pole to pole in an unbelievable speed. This Operation High Jump is connected with the fact that so many believe that there's something going on in the Antarctica that's going to control the future destiny of the world. There are those who believe that Antarctica is a gateway, an opening, to, a, to, a, to, a, uh, to an entrance. To a, like the Lord said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They believe that Antarctica is a gateway into a, into a spirit supernatural world. And of course, you know, you say, well, now, preacher, you're getting off into the wild stuff now. Well, let's just put it out there to say it's something that's worth looking at because uh, the Secretary of Defense, I think his name was James Forrestal, who was very privy to what... Uh, to what uh, this uh, admiral, a very honorable man, Admiral Richard Byrd, he was privy to what was going on down there, but he did not want to march to the party line. And do you know what happened to uh, James Forrestal? He wound up jumping out of a window at Bethesda Naval Hospital. But his family does not believe he jumped out of that window at Bethesda Naval Hospital. They believe he was pushed. In other words, he was murdered. Why? Because he did not want to march to the tune of the globalist. In plain words, they got on to something that they didn't need to get on to. 
Richard Byrd was nosing around in an area he didn't need to be nosing around in. But they have to cover their trail when they cover this stuff. They're going to be careful about it. Did you know that this pope has already made it plain that once we come in contact with extraterrestrials, E.T., that you say, do you believe in E.T.? I believe in demons, <laughs> evil spirits. But once they come in contact with E.T., that it'll be the Pope's pleasure and the pleasure of the, of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church to baptize them yeah. into the Christian faith. Now, see what I'm saying? Now, let me tell you something, folks. He said that. And then in Mount Graham out there in Arizona, Mount Graham, which to the Apache Indian is one of the most holy sites on earth, that Mount Graham has an observatory. Guess what they named it? Lucifer. Now, after a while, you start saying to yourself, they're telling us one thing, but they're doing something else. For example, the Goddard tunnel, a, a tunnel when they opened this thing and dedicated it, they, they had a sacrifice to the goat god. That's what that was all about, a sacrifice to the goat god of the underworld. And that when CERN built this building over here on top of an ancient site of Apollo, one of his temples, to the underworld, to the gate of hell, that when they built this thing on top of it, the Hindu government, the Hindu, the India, gave them a round circle with Shiva in the center of it, dancing the dance of destruction, the, the Hataraja, something like that, the dance of destruction. The idea at CERN is that they're, they're going to collide these particles together, and at the moment that they collide, they're going to see what took place when the Big Bang took place. Now, that's what they're telling folks. But the point is that when they collide them, they're destroying something, and in the process of destroying, they are opening up something. See? They're opening up a channel to another world, what have you. All right. So this is what on the surface is happening at CERN, but there seems to be an awful lot going on under the surface. In plain words, this is for public consumption. What are they doing? Why did they project an image of Cali on a huge building up there in New York? Why are they building a gateway to hell up there in New York? Why are you all of a sudden getting all of this stuff from, this, from the elitist, from the globalist? Why is it all of a sudden it comes out about all of this spirit cooking? Why this Pizzagate stuff? Why all this stuff about this contact with, uh, with demonic beings, why is all of this all of a sudden showing up for the public? I believe they're brainwashing the people to get ready for something to show up. And when it shows up, folks, it's going to show up as the great Savior, Messiah, deliverer of mankind. Now, we, all, we know there's only one Messiah. And there's only one Savior. But uh, until the day he died, uh, Admiral Richard Byrd stuck to his guns and nothing would move him from the fact that there's something way beyond our understanding and ability going on in the Antarctic. Way beyond it. Now the Antarctic, folks, gets down to a temperature of 160 degrees below zero with winds of 200 miles an hour or more blowing in certain areas at certain times. It's much colder than the Arctic. It's much more inhospitable than the Arctic. And there's only one creature that lives there year round, only one, and that's the emperor penguin. They have other penguins, but they come and go. But this one creature is able to live there year round, showing you how desolate that place is, yet, you can go back and look at ancient maps. You can look at ancient maps, and these ancient maps show that the Antarctica that we know today is not the same as what it used to be. That there are places down there that correspond to an entirely different world than the world we know now. This is why the Apostle Peter says that the world that then was, you make a big mistake of trying to judge everything today that's been in the past by the way things are now. 
That's a huge mistake. A huge mistake. So what's all this mean, preacher? It means that what you're seeing right here in Jerusalem and these 70 nations that are meeting right now in Paris, France, and Paris is about probably, what, about five hours ahead of us, somewhere along in there, six, seven hours. They're meeting in Paris, France right now, these 70 nations. Have you noticed 70? You know how many elders that the Lord took with, that, that the Moses took with him to go to that mountain? Seventy. Seventy is locked in with the Gentiles. Seventy nations, seventy nations are meeting to determine the fate and future of Israel. How many of you ever read any of this stuff that comes out about every time somebody does something against Israel, something happens to the weather? You know, and I'm not one to jump on a bandwagon real quick. For example, Katrina. They've made connection with Katrina and what went on in Israel. And what they're, forcing, uh, what they're forcing Netanyahu, who's the current prime minister, and forcing Israel to do, that it's definitely connected with the weather, that God's doing something. For example, did you know that there's been over a thousand tremors, tremors out in California uh, since this stuff started with Kerry and Obama here in the last few months? They've got a list of them here. Would you like to hear some of them? <laughs> I didn't know if I still had your attention or you... You were uh, sailing off into the wild blue yonder. Listen to this. There have been a thousand tremors, earthquakes, California, Nevada, since December the 23rd. That's a lot. Uh, related to UN Resolution 2334. The French also had record floods in Paris during their June the 3rd, 2016 peace conference. Germany did too. Laurie Cardoza Moore, director of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, another pro-Israel group, sent out an action letter to members Friday asking them to contact U.S. Ambassador Samantha Power and tell her not to support any more anti-Israel resolutions. Now that's just a few. There's a whole lot more than that, but you can be sure of this. Watch carefully what happens after this event today in Paris, France. Watch what happens. God can shake the earth. He's shaking it before and he'll shake it again. All right. Now, I guess you can tell from what I've said this morning, I'm pro-Israel. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm unapologetic about it. I am pro-Israel. Uh, well, it's 15 minutes till we run out of time. I was going to give you some of the reasons I am, but we've, we've run out of time. That 45 minutes flew by. Uh, I do not hold a position at all that if you disagree with me uh, that, uh, that we keep you shut up and you're null and void. I don't believe in that. I believe debate's one of the best, best, best things in the world. I believe in debate. I believe it's good. If you, have, if you don't know how to defend your position, you don't have a position. <laughs> That's right. And debate is a very good thing. That's why the Bible said be, be ready to give an account or an answer for the things that are in you, what you believe. You need to know. Yes, sir. It is quite remarkable that you got a number 70, don't you? Because that number 70 shows up in the Bible quite a few times. I am too. I am too. The Bible said when you see Jerusalem comes to about with armies by the enemy, get ready, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. And there's a curse to anyone who divides the land. Yes, sir. So uh, I've been there six times, five times with Brother Bob Bevington, and then one time I led a tour over there. And I've been to Israel six times, enjoyed it thoroughly, absolutely. If, you, if, if the Lord doesn't come back soon, if you get an opportunity to go over there, go. Don't ever let anybody tell you it's commercialized and it's not like you can't enjoy it. That's a bunch of garbage. That's somebody that's never been there. You go over there and you walk down the street, some of those streets, the, at Emmaus, Emmaus, 
You can go to Emmaus and walk down the very same street Christ walked down 2,000 years ago. That street's been there for 2,000 years in Emmaus. Yes, sir. Uh, it's the most mysterious place on earth. Yeah. It is. Right now it's summer. And it's in, 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 oh, yes, it's huge. Antarctic is huge. But it's quite a thing. And you'll find, uh, uh, if you do a little research into it, just, just do a little reading on Operation High Jump. Just take that one and see how many areas leads off from that and how many connections and leads you get from Operation High Jump. It's quite a thing. You'd be amazed. You ought to read his diary, and you ought to read about what happened to him when a, when a spiritual, mysterious spiritual creature came and literally stopped his airplane and took him out of it and put him into this place, and he communicated with this guy who said, we're watching you, we're watching what's happening on earth, and we're going to be intervening before long. And if that diary is legit, then Admiral Richard Byrd said he had contact with a spirit being and that spirit being communicated to him that one day uh, they would intervene in the affairs of man. Well, that's what would happen if something came down from above, wouldn't it? <coughs> Certainly would. We're there. Hallelujah. Get ready. Hey, Amen. Pack your bags. We're ready to go. <laughs> All right. We'll have word of prayer. We'll let you go. God bless you. <laughs> Brother Crane, dismiss us.